Welcome everybody. Sorry we're starting a little bit late. We're just waiting for the uh, people to fill up. But yeah, welcome everyone. And uh, this is a member seminar um, given by uh, Terry Cannon, who is a research fellow here at IDS. Uh, my name is James Andrews and I'm here in the communications team. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. This is the second part um, in the series that Terry is currently doing on neoliberalism and how it is crucial for understanding development. Uh, if you are unable to see part one, it is currently up on the RDS YouTube uh, page. So I'd really encourage you to go over there and watch that after the seminar, pick up on those ideas there. Uh, I should just say as a little bit of housekeeping, we are recording this seminar. Um, what I might do is for the Q&A at the end, if you want to ask a question uh, and you don't want that bit to be recorded, that's absolutely fine. I can pause the recording uh, or we can chop it out. Um, as I don't want to limit the discussion, if you want to ask some controversial or some big thing like that, it's absolutely fine. Just please let me know and that bit won't be recorded. Uh, for the Q&A at the end, um, there's two options as well for asking questions. You can either uh, raise your hand in the little hand raising function. I'm sure you guys all know this by now and I'll uh, uh, tell you to unmute and read it out. Or you can type in the chat and I can read it out for you. Uh, so yeah, with no more ado, over to you, Terry. Please take it away. Thank you very much, James. That's very kind of you. Um, you. You can see I've got a fuzzy background, but I haven't been able to fuzzy my hair, which badly needs cutting. And I don't know, that's another three months before I can get a haircut, so that's going to be quite serious. Um, right, so if you haven't managed to see part one, that doesn't matter. This session should be relatively freestanding, so don't worry about that too much. Uh, but. Obviously, it's going to make more sense if you can go back to, to look at that. And I also want to explain what I did last time, that this is not my research area. The reason I'm doing this is because I felt it necessary to understand how neoliberalism was affecting my life and my work, not just my work, but my life, all of our lives, and also how it's affecting development studies. And we will get back to that, and I hope have a good discussion of that at the end. So I'm going to start by sharing my uh, screen, although I've lost the little button for doing that. Um, help me, James. I see that seems to have gone off my screen. It should just be in the top right next to the. Oh, yeah, there it uh, is. Got it. Icon. Yeah. There you go. It's very slow at my end. And can you see PowerPoint? We can't, no, Terry. OK, hold on. Is it there now? There we go. You got it. OK. Is it on full screen now? It is, yes, sir. OK, thank you very much. Now, I should say if there's something I say which isn't really um, clearly um, explained, then, mm -hmm. then do put do your put hand, hand up, up for that. that. But James, you'll have to let me know because I can't see the chat box uh, or the hands while I'm speaking um, like this. So if I say something you need explaining, stop at that slide so it can be done more easily. This is where we left uh, off last time. This is the last slide from the first session. And what I was emphasizing here is the incredibly confusing terminology, um, because around this, we have this problem that on the so-called left wing and the right wing, we have both using words that are similar to liberal or liberty, both use freedom. Uh, and uh, it's a bit clearer what they say, freedom to do what or from what. Um, um, I had some very good help last time from one of the participants to point out that a better word now than liberal in the United States is to talk about progressives. This means that some of the language might get a bit uh, less confusing. Um, but basically, this was a key point of understanding the terminology um, around neoliberalism, because the word neoliberalism, of course, is a combination of neo, meaning new, and liberalism which means basically 
free market ideas, laissez-faire capitalism of the up to the 19th century into the 20th century. So we will be looking at that um, uh, a little bit later on as to why that is uh, relevant. So we're now moving into, oh, and here is a simple definition of neoliberalism. Um, I quite like it. There are many, many, and it, it is, of course, partly contested. Uh, what we want to think about around neoliberalism is the idea of the in invisible hand, which, of course, goes back to Adam Smith and the idea of the market uh, regulating behavior of goods and services and therefore regulating human behavior. Uh, the way that it gives priority to markets, which we will see in a minute, the retreat of the state, diminished role of the state. Um, what some people talk about is the bonfire of the red tape, as if red tape meaning regulation and um, state um, influence and interference in the behavior of markets is um, seen to be something bad. And the kind of ideology of greed being good because neoliberalism justifies the idea that if you pursue your own self-interest, it will automatically produce the well-being of everyone. So this is kind of key parts of why it's, an, it's a philosophy. Some people call it a religion. Some people get confused because they think it's the same as capitalism. No, I think it's a version of capitalism. There are many kinds of, of capitalism. And that's dealt with in the discussion and questions from part one, which you can go back to. Some people see it as uh, being the same as globalization. I don't believe it is, although globalization has been assisted by the philosophy of um, uh, neoliberalism. We also have to understand something which is relatively new with neoliberalism, and that is where corporations themselves become the commodity, a commodity to be bought and sold and destroyed within the market for corporations. And this is uh, become much more significant under neoliberalism. We might return to that later on, because um, uh, un under neoliberalism, um, well, under capitalism generally, there is a tendency towards monopoly where there is less market. And we can return to that at the end as well. And in, in this context, we might discuss venture capitalism and the idea of asset stripping. So I'm just kind of giving you some of the words, the flavors of what goes on around the idea of neoliberalism. Um, why am I concerned about it? Because it has profoundly affected my life. It has affected everyone's life, um, mostly for in, in negative ways. So, so I think one of the problems is that um, if you're as old as I am, you have seen this change over 40 years and can see incremental changes that have been to the detriment of human well-being. And it is much more difficult to see it if you're younger, because it's just what you've got is the norm. It's taken to be the norm. So I really want to emphasize this, and we'll come back to that in relation to development studies. Um, so some of the things that have gone on with neoliberalism, a key part, of course, is privatization, favored um, since Reagan and Mrs. Uh, Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, in the 1980s. Um, affecting the utilities, water, energy, um, sewage, telecoms, um, it, it, all of these privatized. And we have some interesting, um, um, not only in this country, but, but around the world, some of you may be aware of the huge disputes that happened in some um, developing countries, including Bolivia, where there were huge fights around a, a French water company that got the contract to run water services in parts of Bolivia. Um, we have ludicrous situations here as well because there are many different water companies. Now in Britain and the house that I lived in until last year near Brighton was served by two water companies. One company looked at the water coming into the house, the fresh water, and the other company was responsible for the sewage and the dirty water going out of the house. Um, really, really strange stuff. Transport, and you've probably all heard about the railways in Britain, buses, Uber, um, uh, and, and so on, which we won't have a great deal of time to go into. Um, I will come back to the railways in a minute just to illustrate some of the um, craziness of that system. Something you might know less about, which is extremely serious, is the effect of neoliberalist privatizations on the legal and the penal system, 
where forensic labs, which used to be run by the government, were outsourced and privatized with huge disputes about them doing a bad job, um, prioritizing profit over doing good science and um, an, a, a large number of uh, criminal cases collapsing because the quality of the laboratory services was so poor. Then we have prison privatization and security where we had uh, privatized companies which would be putting the tags on um, prisoners uh, when they were released on license. So they would be wearing this, this um, tag around their ankle and there was a lot of corruption around that. Um, and the company, one of the companies that was doing that was fined several million pounds for the corruption around managing the contracts for doing, doing that. We have the NHS, which um, had to in, introduce an internal market, which led to a situation, some say, that 10% of all NHS spending was going on the accountancy by which one department sold or transferred stuff to the other department and them all having to do complicated um, uh, accountancy um, things going on and corporatized and covert privatization going on, trying to set it up um, for full on, more, more full privatization later on. Um, care homes for the elderly, uh, largely privatized. They used to be run mainly by local government. And here we have a very real impact of this because the privatized um, care homes have been a disaster in COVID. And that is partly because of the mis mismanagement, partly because of the outsourcing of their labor, because they're pushing down the labor costs. And some of the people working as carers are on these very um, difficult contracts and they were going around between homes, not tested for COVID and COVID was spreading between this. And this is where the highest part of the death toll in Britain was coming from, were people in care homes with tens of thousands dying from, uh, from them, partly as a result of the privatization of the care system. And that involves outsourcing. Outsourcing has been the, the fla key flavor of neoliberalism. So government departments outsource um, their tasks um, and they become commissioning agents. So for example, a local government, my partner used to work for a local government and she said, we now just commission um, tendering for different tasks. So different tasks get tendered for and we outsource it. Now, the difficulty here is maintaining control over quality. And that's um, a, an issue. Catering and cleaning, uh, universities, lots of companies outsource their catering and cleaning, which means that the employees work for an outside company. They push down their um, quality of contract and so on um, in a very, uh, with generally very negative effects. In education, we might come back to this in discussion because we have the problem of rankings. So all schools in Britain had to go into rankings to say which were the best, which were the um, worst and so on. And instead of having a system in Britain where the education system ensured that everyone had a good school to go to near to them, you had this competitiveness between them um, and alongside it with privatization um, into uh, quasi private institutions, which um, are still getting state money to run them, but with private benefits to the owners and the senior staff of, of them. Universities corporatized, um, the goals set by governors, not educators, which I hope we'll come back to. It's undermined the quality and we have the problem of grade inflation. And I consider that research has been distorted in order that it is compliant with what government would prefer to be researched and how it is researched. And casual labor, and this includes um, teaching staff, not at IDS, but um, the average in British universities is that half the staff teaching students are on casual contracts. They will be part-time tutors, they will be adjunct staff, as they call them in the United States. They will have very poor conditions of work. They will not have a long-term contract. They might be contracted from September to the summer, and then they don't know if they're going to work again in the autumn and so on. And pushing down of labor rights, um, crushing the unions, which began uh, in this country, especially with Mrs. Thatcher. Um, deregulation of the finance and um, um, 
sector um, and, and industry. And there are a number of examples here which are interesting. Um, uh, Boeing and the deregulation which affected the quality of the Boeing uh, MAX aircraft, which, as you know, has only just been allowed back into service after two crashed. And it was um, uh, found with investigations that this was a result of inadequate supervision of the way in which they were constructed and the safety systems on board. In 1986, we had the so-called Big Bang, where the city banking and finance in Britain, and it was very similar in the United States, were deregulated with the um, uh, result of that being um, pursuit of um, profits um, above service and with uh, a big increase in corruption, money laundering fines on huge banks like HSBC, Citicorp for laundering money from criminals and drug cartels and in, in relation to um, uh, the management of uh, foreign exchange markets and corruption in the foreign exchange markets. Um, and more recently, we have the COVID um, um, illness and the corruption around uh, PPE, personal protection equipment, where um, government gave contracts. Um, thanks to Phil for uh, last time uh, mentioning this as an important thing. Uh, giving contracts to suppliers that have no experience whatsoever in this uh, business, uh, many of them with private connections to senior government um, party people. Oh, here's going back to the railways, because this is a very interesting one, because many, many people in Britain have always complained about the railways, but these are new complaints around the privatisation. So here we have the rail system in Britain, which used to be one system, one company. You can see all the different colours here. These are all the companies operating railways. These are the owners of those companies. So we have 24 railway operators run by about nine corporations with a situation. If you travel between London and Brighton, there are three train companies, uh, operators, which are all owned by the same corporation, but they charge different prices. They, if you get on the wrong train, for example, at Gatwick, if you, if you get on the Gatwick Express, Without the proper ticket, you'll have to pay an extra eight pounds. Um, incredibly confusing. And who would know this um, if you're just arriving with jet lag from another country? So um, extremely difficult um, uh, situations there. But perhaps more serious was the financial sector and banking, which fortunately you have a quick way into that, certainly in the American system, with this film, which is based on a book by one of the people who was involved in it. And uh, at, um, at least one review says that, it, and the author of that book says it's a pretty realistic description of what went on. So you can see there at the bottom, this is from the final screen of the, of the film, um, six million people lost their homes. So this was what was for shorthand called the subprime um, crisis, which was around the um, bubble of mortgages being wrongly issued um, and the collapse of that. And this film is about some people who foresaw that um, and tried to warn about it, but their warnings were ignored. So um, where do we take that into the global south, if we want to use that terminology? And here, many of you will have heard of structural adjustment programs, which is where, if you like, neoliberalism was forced onto um, the global south through um, policies which roughly were called the Washington Consensus. This is because the World Bank, the IMF and the United States government are housed in Washington. They all basically had a very similar view of what should happen to deregulate and um, privatize the um, company, uh, sorry, countries around the world with the WTO based in Geneva, but joining in in the fund. And this is, I'm not going to go through this, this is a basic list of the characteristics of the structural adjustment programs. And these were conditions, unless you uh, agreed to do this, then you would not get your loan from the World Bank or the IMF. So this is how the neoliberal strategy was spread around the world. So um, 
Last time I covered item one here, we're now going to look at item two of my outline, which is what has happened over the last 200 years. And it has been the transition from laissez-faire, that is the first liberalization, the, the, what was called the free market enterprise idea of, of the original capitalism, through when welfare capitalism, which is what we would call the National Health Service, unemployment benefit, pensions and, and social housing in, in Europe, and then back to neoliberalism in the last 40 years. Um, the, in the capitalist West, uh, reverting to um, neoclassical economics. So why did it happen? Um, um, and we have to mention here that during this process of laissez-faire capitalism and pushing into welfare capitalism, there were anti-slavery movements, including in Britain and France, the other countries where slave, slavery was part of the movement, and there were slave rebellions, as you, you will know. Um, and there were class struggles and gender struggles, for example, around votes and workers' rights and standards, the right to unionize. And there were independence movements and resistance in the colonies of Europe, which were to fight for independence and liberation from the colonial powers. Um, now, I'm not going to have time to go into that, but why I want to log that is that these things were always contested. This was not just the winning of laissez-faire capitalism without there being protests. And these protests consisted of um, liberation movements from those in the global south, class and gender struggles in the global north, um, and 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 so on. So we need to understand that this is this was not taken sitting down, and there was this transition to what loosely we could call welfare capitalism. So in the past two hundred years, economics, which was originally called political economy, emerges as the social science that analyzes capitalism. Now, capitalism is basically is the first mode of production or economic system that requires analysis. The previous system loosely calling it feudalism, did not have the need. It was much less complicated. It did not have that need for um, social political analysis. So part of it is the emergence of economics as a process by which we understand um, what is going on. Ricardo Adam Smith assessed the role of free trade and comparative advantage as some of the earliest ideas of um, economics including especially trying to find out why some countries were richer than others. Um, and I think a key point here is that when capitalism began, we're talking about thousands and thousands of competing firms, most of them family or individually owned. So there was an opportunity for much more free market competition in the sense that Adam Smith was discussing. Since then, of course, there are many fewer companies uh, and um, the large ones are, are all um, enormous and control economies and, and policy, politics. Working conditions under neoliberal and under laissez-faire capitalism were generally terrible, including child labor. And this again was pushed back through struggle and philanthropists and others who were pushing for reforms in this. And in Britain, certainly, there were pro-slavery groups and anti-slavery groups in, in the mix while all of this was going on. And class struggle around education, health, food. Um, for example, food. Um, in Britain, food was seriously contaminated by those who wanted to make profit. So as you all are probably aware that drugs are often cut, as it's called, by the drug dealer to maximize increased profit, um, uh, flour would be cut with chalk or other contaminants, which meant that people got less healthy, nutritious food um, and so on. And of course, gender struggle, struggles um, primarily around voting, but also around other rights for women. So in the past 200 years, there was this whole set of struggles moving away from the idea of laissez-faire capitalism towards things that would control and um, regulate the way capitalism operated in order that there would be better human well-being. It was around improving human lives and well-being, especially for those 
who were um, at the bottom of the economic pile, politically and economically. Now, to illustrate this process of, of how this changed, I'm going to show two maps. This was Britain before the Industrial Revolution. So this is around 1701. The population total is around only around 6 million. And the density of the population is shown by these shadings. And, and if we um, had the opportunity to look at this, we would see that the dense populated areas basically, and I'm being simplistic here, but by and large, reflect soil fertility. Here in the feudal system, the wealth was from the land. There was very little industry. There was some at small scale. Um, in fact, the north of Brighton around here was the uh, one of the largest iron production industries, all small scale on streams and so on, uh, um, using forest charcoal and, and, and local ironstone um, around here. Uh, that of course changed fundamentally. So basically this is a map of soil fertility. Population was working on the farms. A huge proportion of the population were farm laborers. And you can see the areas like this, which you will see are very different in the next slide, were basically empty. This is upland hilly area around here, basically empty. We'll see that it changes quite fundamentally. Here in feudalism, and I'm oversimplifying, the wealth is in almost entirely from the land, and the land is owned by a tiny minority who are the aristocracy, the lords, the earls, the dukes, and so on, who control the land on behalf of the, of the monarch. And the system is a, very much a pyramid with the king, the emperor at the top, and the ordinary people at the bottom who are actually doing the work with some inter interim groups. Uh, of course, up next to the king, you've got the lords who actually control the land on behalf of the monarch. Now, we're not going to have time to go into this. This is a fundamentally different framework and hierarchy than emerges with capitalism. And on the right hand side here, after the Industrial Revolution, beginning of the 20th century, you can see we have a much bigger population. It's 33 million. And you can see now there's some very, very dense population over here. You can see the density here. You can see one area that was empty is now one of the most densely populated parts of the country. This is where you had the iron and coal industry here. Here is coal and um, iron and engineering. Here is coal and iron and engineering. Here is coal and iron and engineering. The same here with shipbuilding and the same here with coal, iron and shipbuilding here in Glasgow. So the, the map is fundamentally different. Um, and the re reason for that is that the hardware of capitalism is fundamentally different from that of feudalism. The agriculture, the land is the key to making money. On the right, it is corporations, companies, and uh, raw materials, which enable you to make money. And so here we have another small class of capitalists and the vast majority of people our workers here still before the service sector gets very big. You've got a large number of the population, a high proportion of the population is working in industry and related activities. So looking at this over a scale of 500 years, and I've chosen that because 1500 is the beginning of European expansion and the beginnings of trade, slavery and colonization. We have the feudal system, and I'm not going to have time to go into that. You can look up any one of these boxes here um, for more detail. Um, we have the, the shrinking of the feudal system, which has its own class structure, and the expansion of the capitalist system, replacing it with different kinds of classes, fundamentally different um, priorities, different hardware, and different software. The software of this system is fundamentally different. So this is the, the feudal system basically shrinks. It doesn't disappear entirely because, as you well know, in Britain we have some what are called feudal remnants. We still have an aristocracy. We have a House of Lords, which is now much less the hereditary aristocracy and it's much more appointed lords, but it is still a very strange kind of second House of Parliament. And we also have the monarch, of course, um, which is another feudal remnant because 
um, it, it, it is a part of the old feudal system to have a monarchy. And of course, this goes side by side with what's going on overseas. Now, the fact that I'm showing this as shrinking is not because overseas, of course, shrinks. This is as these com countries become independent. So the role of the colonial powers diminishes here as they become independent. Now, there is a huge argument, which I'm not going to have time to go into here, as to whether this expansion of capitalism was actually possible without the overseas plunder, trade, slavery, and so on. Um, th there is a very powerful argument that it was, capitalism was fueled by this, um, but we're not gonna have time to go into that. What we need to understand is two things. One is where does the enlightenment fit in? Because the enlightenment is where you have the arrival of science and social science and thinking about rights. And this is quite an important part of it because capitalism, um, different from feudalism where everyone knows their place, there's a very strict hierarchy. Capitalism has in theory, the idea that all people are equal. And this was a key part of the Enlightenment argument was that you were a free individual within the capitalist system to sell your labor wherever you wanted. And this was a part of the idea which emerges with capitalism that there is such a thing as rights or human rights, um, which eventually gives rise to the idea that you cannot keep women down. In other words, if you have a capitalist system, then it has to justify that everyone has the same rights, although it took more than 100 years for women to get the vote in Britain. Um, it, was, it was because it was inconsistent with the idea of individual liberty, back to that word liberty, which was the argument that laissez-faire capitalism would grant that liberty, which, as you know, is also enshrined in the American um, um, documents of the revolution and the um, independence and in the French Revolution, um, uh, liberty, fraternity, fraternity, and, and so on. But also note that it has taken, and it's still not finished, the rights of women and um, on black lives. So the American documents of, of independence and the revolution against Britain were for the rights of white men and not for women and not for black people. If we can have time, we'll come back there. Now, we also need to see where does development research and aid fit into this process? Because down at this side, as the com countries have become independent, development ideas and other institutions have expanded to fill in there with a new relationship with the um, ex colonies. Now, um, what I mean by rules and hardware and software is that different countries are playing different games, essentially. Now, I go into this in much more detail in my Skills Week session on um, sustainable livelihoods and modes of production. And that video would be will be there, I think, very soon for you to watch if you want to go back to that. Um, let me know and I can make sure you get the link. The idea of societies, economies, political economies, having hardware and rules is quite fundamental, I think, to un understanding what's going on in the world in any, any place. So snakes and ladders are a very simple game, very simple hardware, very simple rules. You land on the head of a snake, you go back down. If you land on the bottom of a ladder, you go up. There are dice, there are counters to move you around. Very simple hardware, very simple software. The rules are the software. Monopoly, very, very different, very complicated hardware with hotels, money, sim these symbols, and so on, um, and very different software. The rules that govern how it's played are very, very complicated. Now, one thought here is to think what happens when a country that's playing monopoly, let's say it's a colonial imperial power, what happens when it encounters another people who are playing a different game? Whose rules win? Now, you could argue relatively simplistically that the rules of the dominant country, the powerful country, which after all is, imposes its will with military power, those rules win. But what we find in much of the world is you get hybrids where the old system is hybridized with the new system. Um, that again, we might come back to discussion. So this is the idea of modes of production. 
And a mode of production is a system in which a way of producing in society in which you have the combination of the hardware, the, for, the things, and the software, which is the rules that govern the game. Now, my argument around here in, in neoliberalism is that we have capitalist modes of production that basically see the hardware as being privately owned and run and operated with the workers who do the working, those are the hardware components. And the software determines how the profits are allocated and who is allowed to own the hardware. Workers don't own the factories, the hardware. Uh, workers, pe the people, don't own the railways. Well, actually, they used to when they were nationalized. So it was seen as a public good to own the utilities, the water companies and the electricity companies and so on. They were seen as a public good, which should be mono monopolized. So basically what we're seeing is a transition from laissez-faire capitalism, where everything was a free for all and privately owned through to welfare capitalism, I'm simplifying, in which it was acknowledged in a, quite a significant number of countries that some things were what were called natural monopolies like water supply, electricity, and so on. And those natural monopolies should be public goods. They were run by the state on behalf of the population as part of the welfare provision for the population. Now, neoliberalism does not accept those rules. So down here in the rules of the game, neoliberals have fought for the deregulation and the privatization, which enables this software, these rules of software, to be changed fundamentally so that you have a very different setup in the way in which the society operates, which privileges the minority, the 10% or the 1%, whatever you want to call them, who are able to control through power, the power given them to by political parties, which favor the neoliberal ideology in order that they also as a class can self benefit through the accumulation of the wealth which goes to them as the minority. So neoliberalism is a very significant tweaking of the rules of the hardware management um, in order to promote privatization, deregulation, and so on, all of which reduces the well-being of people who used to benefit from the um, um, public goods of the mon monopolized systems and so on. And I'm going to finish on this slide because I do want to allow time for discussion. So basically what we have is in, in um, countries is the political economic system governs the rules which allocate the assets of society, for example, who owns land, factories, and so on, distributes the income, age levels, whether or not there's proper taxation to redistribute for the welfare of the citizens, um, the services, the social ways, such as education, health services, and so on, um, the welfare provision, so-called universal benefits like unemployment benefit. If you get unemployment, unemployed, you have the right to certain benefits. If you get sick, sick pay, and so on. And then targeted benefits for particular needy groups or social goals like Enrega in, in India. And all of these are really determined by the way in which the political economic system allocates the rules according to the philosophy, the religion of the system that you've got. Is it welfare capitalism or is it neoliberalism? So what we've seen in the last 40 years is the reduction of spending on many of these things in order that there is a redistribution of wealth towards the minority. So basically it is tweaking the rules of the software in order that those who control the hardware control it privately for private benefit and benefit from the changes in the software to bring more of that benefit to the minority. Um, finishing off here, where does overseas aid fit in? We could have a, a discussion of that because of course that is comes from taxation in Britain, mainly from taxation. And we could also look in my field, where is funding coming from um, to fund um, uh, poor people are, who are facing up to climate change. Um, now, I'm going to stop there because I think there's plenty 
that that's a logical place to stop, although I've got so much more to say. I haven't finished. It looks like we might have to have neoliberalism part three. This is partly because we have shorter sessions now in the on online sessions are much shorter than they were. And um, um, so my apologies for not finishing. I think there's plenty there to discuss. And I'm very happy when there is a vacancy to finish off with neoliberalism part three. So I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions and um, discussion. Um, my slides will be available if anyone needs to refer to them, but it would be helpful if you can make it clear which slide it is you want to talk about. So I'm going to stop sharing. And invite everyone to um, be wonderful. Oh, we've got too many really to turn on cameras, but if you do want to ask a question, be nice to see who you are. Um, uh, put your camera on if you would like. And you can ask questions, as James said, in two ways. One is put your hand up and James is going to help with the chat box or put it in the chat box. So open up for questions and discussion. I could start with a uh, question, Terry, if no one sure. else wants to. Uh, so I guess, you know, very interesting discussion. I really liked how you kind of went back and discussed, uh, you know, feudalism coming forward through like early capitalism to where we are now. I guess my question is what you see as the future. Where are we going to be in 20 years time, 100 years time? Um, from a discussion, I think, uh, yeah, took the tone that we're moving in the wrong direction. Um, and I guess the next part of that would be, do you see any hope? Like where is, um, you know, where should we be putting our faith in uh, social movements or in, uh, you know, capitalism moving forward at all? Or yeah, where would you put your hope? Um, it, it is a very good question. I won't go for 100 years from now, but maybe 20 years from now. I think social movements are absolutely vital. I think Extinction Rebellion and Black Lives Matters achieved more in the space of a few campaigns and months than um, huge discussions going on, on before. I think they really, really changed uh, the scene in, in making it. I think the, the value of social movements, especially those that go out onto the streets, um, um, and, and which remain uh, peaceful um, is that they really force people to think. Even if people react against them, we know that um, some surveys show that people reacted negatively to Black Lives Matters. But I, I don't think we look for immediate um, impact on that. I think we look for a medium term rethinking of people. And of course, a huge impact on young people um, in both of those movements. And um, Older people will uh, become less effective and die out. And so the younger people having these ideas and championing them is going to be vital. But I do think there is too much complacency. I think that institutions are tainted by neoliberalism. The individualist agenda is very predominant. I think we constantly have to be fighting back against it, including in development studies. I think that development studies is hugely tainted by neoliberal thinking. Um, including what we research and what we're allowed to research and how we link up with um, um, the university and with government and so on. So I, I think we have to have constant debate pushing. And I think for the younger ones, uh, amongst your students especially, what is really needed is for deep thinking on how it is influencing our everyday life, um, pushing back on it. So. Four years ago, the students at Sussex in, engaged in a strike and then an occupation of the university um, administrative offices to try to prevent the outsourcing of catering and cleaning to um, in the university. They failed. Um, some universities are bringing those services back into the um, university so they will be proper university employees with better rights and so on. So I think all the time it is thinking about why is this happening? Why is this done? But as I said, the problem is the change is slow and incremental. And if you come into IDS now, you don't know that it was very, very different 20 years ago and still significantly different five years ago. Uh, and so everything looks normal and everyone um, plays the game. And I think that there is too much complacency and acceptance of, um, the, of this becoming um, the norm and acceptable. Oh, thank you so much. That was very interesting. 
Uh, looks like we've got three questions now. The first one coming in from, uh, why don't we take three at a time? So Peter, if you could go first and then I'll throw it to the other people. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Terry. Really uh, interesting. Uh, it's great to have a chance for part two, and I'm sure there will be a part three, possibly even a part four, because this is also <laughs> emerging in real time. Um, I, you know, I think your observations about how this affects us personally is really interesting. I think that's an important approach to bring to it. You know, I was very struck when I looked at your maps uh, of the sort of pre-1700 and then post, uh, you know, where I grew up in the northwest of England in Lancashire in the Lancashire coal fields. It's very striking, the big red blob which appeared, uh, you know, which highlighted uh, all the increased industrial activity, rapid in, uh, population growth and, you know, a whole evolution of sort of social and cultural and political experience. And of course, that's that's been short lived, relatively speaking, in overall time, you know, looking back at your historical trajectory and that the experience that uh, people have in those communities now has is is of one of being left behind because that industrial growth, which was very rapid and provided employment and economic opportunity has now disappeared. And of course, that sense of loss and disillusionment is being tapped into by politicians who unashamedly use very individualistic messaging and suggesting that, you know, we can go back. And we saw that with Trump in America and we see it in, uh, you know, even in a, probably our, our current political situation uh, where the famous red wall in the north of England has has, you know, been overturned because people are being drawn into a belief that something different is possible, but that different is going back to what we had before. So, you know, I think these are universal issues. Uh, we will see them play out. We are seeing them play out in many, many different contexts. You know, what do we learn from this historical trajectory and what can we do as development studies thinkers and practitioners to help to engage uh, those communities who feel most left behind and also don't feel connected to the kinds of social movements that you know many of the ones that you've just described today that we might see as more progressive yep thank you oh and if i could throw it to uh philip proudfoot if you'd like to uh unmute and uh ask a question hi i should also introduce myself because i'm a new fellow uh, at ids so uh, hello and yeah i guess my question follows on quite neatly from that previous one from the northwest to the northeast and i often think about you know one thing i felt perhaps was missing in that presentation when it comes to the UK and development within the UK is that is that the way it's put out in the UK is hypercentralization in London most recently, right? Hypercentralization. I know a quote from Boris Johnson once said that this is of course not the Northeast, but he said, a pound spent in Croydon is infinitely more valuable than a pound spent in Strathclyde. And I wonder what you think perhaps around localization or decentralization is one potential avenue to start addressing some of these development issues as they manifest in the UK around the neoliberal model. Thank you. Oh, and let's just take one more, Terry, if that's OK. Yeah. So this one comes in from uh, Rusia. Uh, she asks, with regards to the ownership of the means of production for the public good, it is clear that uh, hardware gets privatised. Uh, it gets out of hand and the people benefiting from it. Uh, but is there a guarantee that citizens would have power over the software uh, of public goods with state ownership? Under what system would this be feasible? Okay, can I take the last one first, uh, Rocio? Thank you. Um, if there is any opportunity to re-public, re bring back those things into public ownership, um, you're not going to get good software to run it unless there is a, um, a movement, significant movement, led by people, unions, um, uh, popular groups, which insists that the so software has to be for the benefit of all people. Um, so uh, those two things obviously have to go together. Uh, simple nationalisation without changing the ethos of how um, the, the salaries of the senior staff and so on would not really be be that um, uh, significant or sufficient of a change. So I think your point highlights the fact that it has to be part of a social movement. Now, some people will say I'm being unrealistic because basically I want to go back to the uh, post-war welfare capitalism with nationalised industries um, as we had. Uh, I'm going to admit, yes, that's what I would prefer. I think that's the only way to solve the problems as they affect people and their welfare and their well-being 
is to is to have that. Um, we, if you like, the National Health Service has managed um, to maintain um, its um, public status with all the erosion that's going on within it, the being eroded by parasites within it and around the edges. Um, it is a model of how the um, under COVID, we've seen that the people want the software to be the ones that benefit all, all people uh, for the benefit of human of humans, of humankind, if you like. Um, clawing that back for the railway system um, or for the energy system is going to be much more difficult because we have had in the last two years some re-public ownerships of some <clears throat> railway companies because of the problems of running them under the um, contracts that they have. But but the, nobody would really say that those resemble anything like the public state ownership that we had um, in um, in the 1960s and 70s. So I think your question is a very good one, that it, it, it is no point having legal nationalization without the software changing in a way which is pro-people. Um, going to Philips, your, your point is is a very big one about basically about inequality uh, within Britain and, and dominance of, of the London met metropolis. Um, quite, quite clearly class-based biases involved there. It's not my field. I do uh, practically no research on Britain. So I'm going to duck out of it, Philip, um, although I'm sympathetic to the what I think is the problems that you're you're raising. Um, but those those are not new, and they're not new under neoliberalism. The the um, uh, um, so I, I'm going to duck that one, um, and I'm going to take Peter's contribution as a comment rather than a question. I hope you'll be happy with that, or we come back to more general discussion. Okay, looks like we have uh, one more hand raised from uh, Jerka. If you'd like to uh, unmute and ask a question. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much, Terry, um, for bringing us into an epochal um, conversation on a vast uh, scale. Uh, it brings me back to IDS 30 odd years ago when I was a student um, and fellows were searching for the lost paradigm um, after the Thatcher regime has essentially defunded IDS from central funding and and uh, earlier Keynesian social democrat um, economics were out of fashion. But I have a just going back to the beginnings of your presentation, I think what I'm struggling with is what is this neoliberalism that we have lived with over the last 40 years? Um, it has actually evolved. It may no longer be neoliberalism as it was understood and pro promoted. And when we talk about liberal on the spectrum of right to left, for example, in the US, on the right, liberal is is being a communist. So, so liberalism has kind of uh, liberal has fallen out of neoliberalism. And I've just I've been reading uh, Wendy Brown's neoliberalism's uh, scorpion's tail. Uh, which is a fascinating account of uh, neoliberalism essentially evolving, preparing the ground for an attack on the social with its values and narratives and logic, essentially devaluing the social and any any thought of redistribution or equality, but also delinking it from democracy, delinking the governance uh, of society from democracy and uh, building a resentment to democracy, ending up in a very kind of Hayek and authoritarian uh, authoritarianism that's also that's appealing to traditional values and this nihilism that comes from uh, uh, ressentiment. Uh, uh, Peter Taylor talked a bit about you know the people who are, who are left behind and and uh, uh, are you know partly behind let's say take steal, you know take back and make America great again that whole groundswell of of um, authoritarian anti-democratic sentiment uh, so my my question is uh, is it are we right to talk about neoliberalism as the global hegemonic system anymore or should we start to um, kind of reassess that and see whether it is some new form of uh, neoliberalism or you know neoliberalism has evolved is evolving i think and uh, 
And I think you're absolutely right. We're seeing, you know, concentration, monopolies growing and an incredible concentration of wealth and power in fewer hands. But this is not a neoliberal um, philosophy anymore. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but just yeah. throw those no, ideas out. I'm quite happy to go along with that. And Philip's saying that uh, um, we, we don't need the neoliberal word. It's evolving. I, I'm quite happy with that. The purpose of me doing these talks, and, and I actually covered this problem about the word liberal in the first one, the terminology. And, and so um, I think it was Tabitha pointed out that the preferred word now in the United States is progressive. So I replaced that in the first slide. So we can talk about progressives and then we avoid this problem of the word liberal being used both to describe right wing and, and left wing um, thoughts, um, uh, people. Um, so my purpose in this is that I've been teaching here now quite a few years and constantly having to explain what neoliberalism to the students. Very And people, the students say, yeah, we need to know it. Um, and I do this lecture every year. And uh, so my purpose is actually that people know what neoliberalism is, even if it's changing and evolving. I'm quite happy to accept that it's changing and evolving. And to some extent, what I've described around the increasing monopolization and the move um, towards a 1% rather than, um, um, you know, what you might have had in the 1980s. Um, I, uh, yes, I'm qu quite happy for that. But but we need to understand neo neoliberalism before we can understand what it's moved from and is going towards. And that's the gap that I've observed um, amongst um, many of the students. Um, so for, forgive me if I'm not being nuanced enough. I'm very happy to, to do that and, and to move on and to revise it uh, and to look at that. And I think I, to some extent, I've begun that, that process. Um, another point that I would make on that is that what happened in many parts of the world um, in many countries, I'm, I'm talking about um, Africa and um, parts of Asia, is that the neoliberal um, religion, if you like, once it had been taken up through structural adjustment and so on, basically became a license for autocrats and kleptocrats. Um, because although the privatization of the, of the previous state enterprises and so on did take place, it, 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 if you like, it was similar to Putin's Russia, it gave license to those who controlled the state to take control on their own personal behalf. And so you have these very long running leaders in, in Africa who are fundamentally different from those who promoted socialist African socialism in the 60s and 70s and were part of the idea that the liberation movement would grant um, a well-being to people through um, state led um, welfare provision. So we, that, that's another tweak, if you like, of neoliberalism is that it has enabled the capture of the state by many of these country, in many of these countries, which again has been a form of um, personal aggrandizement, kleptocracy behavior and so on. I, I think we need to understand what it's doing in Britain. I, I mean, I think, um, uh, uh, Philip, although you want to critique the term, I think the COVID, the thing you raised last time around uh, PPP, PPE equipment in the COVID crisis perfectly epitomized a kind of a neoliberal way of dealing with it. It's tendering when you don't have any expertise and so on. You, you can just do what you like and get away with it. Um, so I'm perfectly happy. And maybe in the next, next one, what, what we might have is a debate or a discussion about how we understand the, um, the direction of change and the revisions going on. And I think those would be different in different parts of the world. Would you like to add anything, Phil? Well, just briefly, I guess I don't want to be critical of Terry's presentation in any way, both you can if you want. <laughs> great. No, uh, I'm, perhaps the frustration is more broadly with the way the term is bandied around uh, by people to kind of label anything market related that they disagree with while not labeling other market related things with such a nasty word as what I, what I like to sometimes call the the N word where uh, financialization is the F word, of course. So um, I think we do need better terms to capture, you know, the, the change away from classic neoliberalism uh, or, you know, from the early 1980s 
rolling back the state, rolling out the market neoliberalism that was happening then to the world that we're living in right now, which perhaps has many post neoliberal features or, you know, authoritarian capitalism features um, that are mixing in with and overlapping with the institutions created by neoliberalism. So I guess the uh, my allergic reaction wasn't in any way to your use of the word, Terry, and I think it's great to have this kind of historical examination of what the term was created in order to signify. But I think for discussions about politics today, I would love us all and you know students as well who use the term quite liberally, as it were, in class to try and be more precise what they mean by neoliberalism and, and why. And it's a reminder to myself to do the same. Mm. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience? Okay, shall we uh, wrap up then, Terry? Yeah, sure. Um, somebody has just put one up. So there's a very quick one in the chat, yes. Uh, so yeah, so it's from uh, Dalashi, uh asking, uh, I just want to get more clarity on the term neoliberalism by connecting it to some particular examples. Would you label the new farm law in India a neoliberal form. Uh, I don't know much about this, uh, so I'm not sure if I'm even asking the right question. So it's quite a practical, up-to-date example. Yeah. Um, right. Yes, actually, I was going to mention the farm law and the protests in India as an example of what could potentially be interpreted as um, um, a neoliberal um, idea. Um, I, I think that it's um, designed to benefit um, uh, the elite. It's designed to, but I, I think there are a number of elites in, in India. So um, I think this category of farmer is very difficult in India because the category farmer includes people who own thousands of hectares and are, are multi-millionaires down to uh, someone who's got hardly any land at all and can barely manage enough to eat. So the category of farmer in the farmer protests is very difficult because a lot of it is being led in the areas of um, um, what you might call elite farming in Punjab, Haryana and so on. And um, I would want to have, and I haven't studied it, but I would want to have a much more um, disaggregated idea of what this is meaning in relation to farm, farms and farming. Um, and it goes back to Yerker and uh, Philip's point. I think this is one of the areas where we would need to see how we modified a, a simplistic um, use of the term neoliberal, um, because it's it, it, it clearly is much more complicated because we have a populist um, government, which is overseeing um, something which on face value appears to be a neoliberal approach around farm prices and uh, commodity prices, um, but which has um, other policies which would not be described as neoliberal in the simplistic way. So I think I think we, we have to have these nuances and, and, and Trump, who was in a sense against some aspects of free trade um, and other um, um, leaders in, in Europe who, who are on the um, um, chauvinistic and anti-migrant um, bandwagon, a right-wing populist and so on, who we need to understand as well, where, where that relates to um, um, ideas of free trade and so on. So I think it's quite, um, I think this disaggregation of the idea of neoliberalism around these different polities, these different ways in which, I, I, I think what we have to think about is neoliberalism gave birth, it was the handmaid to these different potential ways in which the elite, and it is always elites who capture, or sections of the elite who capture different ways of bending the rules of neoliberalism towards their own ends, their own class or subclass group ends. Um, and they those are path dependent, they take on different flavors depending, um, some countries have not had a Silicon Valley. So for example, in, in the United States, part of that process of capture was very much driven 
by the so-called big tech businesses, Silicon Valley type businesses, which had particular um, abilities to grasp through um, technical innovations, capturing huge income streams, which of course had a, a highly significant effect on American politics and um, bad taxation, inadequate taxation and, 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 and so on. So in, in um, India, it's different. In each country, that's different. So I think basically the, the basic point I would make, and I make it in the last part of this, which I didn't have time for, is what, what is the software vari variations which become possible on the foundation of neoliberalism for different elite groups to take and capture for their own particular niche interests um, as a result of that. And some of them are political populists. They don't have a, so much of an economic base. They, they have a base where they want power for their own ideological gains. In other cases, it may be around um, an economic win uh, around the promotion of their own particular um, um, activity. So, I mean, Uber and, and uh, the, these companies which have never made a profit. We have to understand, well, okay, the assumption under neoliberalism is that you at least made a profit and that the corporation was a profit-making institute. We now have the extraordinary situation where you have enormous corporations with valuations in the tens of the billions, which have never made a profit. They're, they're based around these kind of rentier um, um, capitalist ideas of where you're trying to capture future profit by taking risks now. And that wasn't really envisaged in the idea of the original neoliberalism. So I think it's about what is it that neoliberalism has let out of Pandora's box as the different pathways that different elite groups can choose. And the key point about that is once neoliberalism has crushed the public interest and the way in which the public well-being is safeguarded by government um, control, um, that that is extremely difficult to claw back. And as um, um, Rosio said earlier on in her question, there's no guarantee that simple renationalization will recapture the public good ethos that was embedded in the nationalization of those different um, sectors. So, so I think that that's where I would be going with the the following on from neoliberal is to understand the explosion of this, what what it in what it has enabled, and the different flavors of what it has enabled. Sorry, that was rather long. Sorry. No problem. I uh, can't see any other questions coming through, so perhaps we should end things there. Um, thank you very much, Terry, for giving this great presentation. Um, it has been recorded and it will be going up onto the IDS YouTube page along with the part one. And yeah, part three coming soon. We're going to have to do it again. <laughs> maybe towards the end of term, maybe week 11 or week 12, we could do it then. But yeah, let's discuss that later. We'll discuss that later, yeah. Thank you very much for everyone for attending. If you'd like to see the slides, uh, perhaps Terry, you could put the slides into the chat and then everyone okay. will be able to see them there. Even when uh, we finished, if I put them there after, will they get them? That'll be yeah. No, it stays in the teams. Teams records everything, uh, and I'll do the same with the uh, recordings as well. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much to everyone for coming, and thank you for those great questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>